how do you describe a Magic the Gathering deck? Experienced players have a rich lexicon to draw upon while talking to each other about decks. This deck I'm playing is a red-white aggro deck. It's a burn deck in Boros colors. A sly variant existing within the Lorehold color identity, if you want to get real creative with your terminology. Certainly, players will have different interpretations of these terms, and arguments about semantics do pop up from time to time. But ultimately, as players, we're more on the same page than we think. Where things get tricky is when it comes time to talk to newer players, or even people with little to no MTG experience to speak of. How do you describe midrange to somebody who is unfamiliar with the concept? It's doable, but it can be a little tricky, and overloading somebody with too many abstract pieces of terminology isn't the best way to build up a practical understanding of the game. This is where simple archetypes end up being very useful. A lot of players start out by building around mechanics or keywords. My first deck was a mono-black Bloodthirst deck, which I played against my brother's Mana Ramp deck and my cousin's Spellslinger deck. And by far the most approachable of these types of decks is Tribal decks. When I tell somebody I'm playing a Zombies deck or a Dragons deck, most novice Magic players will understand roughly what sort of deck I'm talking about, and there will even be plenty of people who don't play the game who can follow along. It helps that tribes usually match mechanically with broad cultural understandings. Zombies are a horde focused around death. Dragons are big flying beasts that shoot fire. Knights are warriors who prefer fair and direct combat. Ninjas are skilled at getting in and out of places sneakily. Slivers are... Okay, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. I'd even say that tribal decks perform an especially important function in EDH. Limited events and 60-card kitchen table magic are probably better ways to learn the game, but for better or worse, EDH has become a big place of onboarding for newer players within the landscape of paper magic, and tribal decks are one of the best options for learning the game within that context. While lots of EDH decks have high levels of complexity, with the structural elements that hold the deck together somewhat obscured to an untrained eye, tribal decks leave large portions of their synergies bare and on the table. To check if a card synergizes with Hackball of the Surging Soul, I don't need to look at anything but the type box on the card. If it's a merfolk, it's worth consideration. These decks are also usually straightforward to play compared to non-tribal decks. Simply play cards of that tribal type, interspersed with lords to maximize the value from those cards, a category which usually includes the commander. A simpler game plan means less to think about on a player's own side of the table, and offers more time and mental space for a newer player to strategize, pay attention to cards their opponents are playing, and get a better feeling for the format as a whole. So yeah, I'm a fan of tribal decks on the whole, particularly in the way they offer a smooth and satisfying experience for newer players. I also don't say any of this to insult more experienced players who like tribal decks. I've built a number of tribal decks over the years, and my current strongest deck is a tribal deck. However, I think a lot of tribal decks end up falling into some lazy deck building patterns, even when they're constructed by players with a decent amount of experience under their belt. Just as having a core creature type can be a helpful hand to hold for newer players, it can be a real limiting factor if a player is unable to break out of that mold. On the surface, zombies, goblins, and dragons all sound like valid game plans, but are those actual plans for playing the game? Let's take a step back for a moment. I'm going to make two statements, the first of which I expect to be fairly uncontroversial, and the second of which might be a bit more challenging to people. Statement 1. Not all tribal cards are good in every tribal deck. Cargun Dragon Rider, though it is more powerful in a dragon deck than in a non-dragon deck, still probably isn't a card that most dragon players want. Statement 2. Not all tribal cards that are good on paper are good in every tribal deck. For a couple examples of this, I'm going to reference the EDH rec page of Mirim, one of the most popular tribal commanders. One card that jumps out is Crucible of Fire, played in 22% of decks. On paper, this card is amazing. The going rate for a basic anthem is 3 mana, maybe 2 mana if you're restricting the creatures it affects, and by that metric this card is giving 6 mana worth of anthem for 4 mana. That's great! Lots of tribal decks would happily accept that kind of efficiency, and a good number of green-black elf decks are happy to run a card that is far worse on an objective level. So what's the problem? Well, anthems are an awkward choice in a dragon deck, because it's not really a go-wide deck. Realistically, you're going to have a low single-digits number of dragons a large portion of the time, 
There aren't that many low-cost dragons, nor are there many cards that produce dragon tokens outside of Mirim, so if you have a board that's big enough to make an anthem good, you are probably already headed either toward victory or toward a board wipe. An even more questionable choice is Acolyte of Bahamut, played in 34% of Mirim decks. This enchantment provides ramp at a decent rate, and it's a great fit in a Corlesa deck, where the commander is 2 mana and has a somewhat modest effect that won't attract too much removal. However, if you've ever played with Mirim, you know that if the Mirim player is allowed to untap with her in play, an avalanche of bad things will frequently follow for the other players at the table, and your opponents need to allow you to untap twice with your terrifying 6 mana commander before Acolyte, a ramp card, has become mana positive. To me, this card is a clear instance of one of the more pernicious side effects of tribal deck building. Just as it's helpful for newer players to be able to rapidly analyze cards based on having and mentioning a card type, as players gain experience, this sort of instinct often gets encoded as a heuristic to follow if they aren't actively pushing back against it. If a card does theoretically helpful things on a theoretically high enough power level, players' brains are often tuned to shortcut a lot of the details, details that really matter. On the surface, if I'm a Mirim player, looking at Acolyte of Bahamut, it's doing all the things I want. It's nice for my expensive dragons to be cheaper, and I really like my commander, so most games I'll have it in play anyway. It's only when we deconstruct what Mirim does as a commander, what a dragon deck is actually trying to do, and what a Mirim dragon deck's strengths and weaknesses are, that the card's issues start to become more obvious. And when that sort of analysis doesn't happen, thousands of players end up keeping a really mediocre win more card in their deck. Okay, so I've laid out some tribal deck building habits that I find to be problematic, and which lead to decks that function worse. With that in mind, how does one make a tribal deck that feels cohesive and effective? Fundamentally, it comes down to developing an identity and a game plan for your deck that's more complex than play insert creature type here. That can be a difficult process, but a good way to start tackling that task is looking at your core tribal cards and asking yourself, what is this offering me? What sort of game plan might play well with these cards? I've built a number of tribal decks over the years, and I'm going to reference some of the more successful ones as examples for this. One such example is my High Power Pirates deck. I picked out a command zone with a couple pseudo lords, started with a calculated number of low cost pirates to utilize their effect, and then added additional pirates and pirate tribal elements on an individual basis, where I thought it was worthwhile to my general game plan to do so. A large part of the deck's game plan features the tribe, and tribal creature beatdown is a genuine win con, but there are also a number of layers to the deck that diverge from the nature of a pure tribal deck, mainly cards centered around tribal payoffs, such as the treasures that Malcolm generates. To me, this deck checks all of the boxes of what good tribal deck building should look like, but this deck is decidedly on a higher power level than most tribal decks, so I'll also mention a couple lower power examples. One of the decks in the $25 pool I've talked about was an Arabo Cats deck. Don't talk to me, the card was like a dollar when I built the deck in 2020. The deck isn't that weird from a composition standpoint. It's running a few of the affordable cat lords and a moderate overall creature count of 27. But it nonetheless is built with a more specific mindset than just play cats. The commander's eminence gives a single cat plus 3 plus 3 until end of turn on each of your combat phases, and already this diverges from the conventional tribal deck mold. Rather than rewarding a critical mass of cats, this commander rewards having a single cat early in the game to get maximum use out of the eminence ability. The commander's on-board effect is an amplification of this. It rewards having a small quantity of large cats, since each cat buffed requires spending 3 mana. For this reason, the deck's creatures are lower cost than ones in a lot of cat decks, and it runs a lower creature count than average in order to have a healthy suite of equipments and a number of draw spells which check the power of a creature on board. In this way, the deck dips into aggro and Voltron themes in addition to being a mid-rangey tribal deck, and this extra attention paid to being cohesive with the tribal core allowed the deck to end up feeling a lot more focused and threatening than most budget tribal decks. As a final example, sometimes I'll stumble accidentally into a tribe. When I built the rogue tribal deck for the $25 deck pool, I didn't actually start with the idea of it being a tribal deck. Rather, I built out the core of the deck with a focus on evasive creatures, curiosity effects, and a high density of interaction, and then I went, wow, I sure have a lot of rogues in this deck. <laughs>
From there, I added the rogue tribal cards, which made sense with the original game plan, which was actually a fair number, since the tribe as a whole is heavily based around evasive creatures. Basically, what I'm trying to convey here is just that a key step in developing a tribal deck is building an identity for it outside of the tribe alone, and finding that identity will work best when it focuses around the core pillars of the deck's game plan. Now, I do get the sense that there may be a lot of you that are feeling pretty safe right now, shielded from what I'm saying in this video by the fact that you don't play tribal decks. It's at this point that I feel the need to tell you that most of the points in this video also apply to any deck based around a specific mechanic or a set of words, such as Enter the Battlefield or Cast from Exile. If you make a deck by throwing together a big pile of stuff focused around that mechanic without considering the broader game plan, your deck is probably going to feel like an unfocused mess for purposes of closing out the game. I talked about this more in my win cons video, but basically when a player chases a particular mechanic or tribe rather than chasing a game plan for their deck to follow, they often end up with a pile of different payoff effects that all contribute toward different goals. In addition, lots of potentially helpful cards may be left by the wayside, with that deck space instead occupied by filler that doesn't meaningfully contribute to what the deck's synergistic elements are actually accomplishing. This kind of sucks on some level, because this game has something like 30,000 cards, and finding the right cards for a deck out of all of those would be a much easier process if it could start and end with a single gatherer search. And honestly, I think that vastness of cards alone is a valid reason to use a tribe, a mechanic, or a few words as a starting point to build upon. Just keep in mind that it is a starting point at the end of the day, and if that's the point you're at, you'd be well served to focus on what's at the heart of your deck, and figure out how to better serve that. Thanks for watching. I'm currently taking submissions for my patron deck review this month, so if you have an extra $3 a month to throw at me and want a chance to have me review your deck, a link to my Patreon is in the description.